All right, so you tell me, is the glass half empty or is it half full? How many of you, by raising your hand, would say it is half empty? Most surely, it is half empty. Oh, come on. We've got to have a few pessimists in the crowd. All right, half full? Everybody, yeah, until it's your glass and you're thirsty, right, right? I'm sure that everyone here has heard that analogy that's supposed to determine whether or not you are an optimist, optimist, you see things brightly, or a pessimist, you see things darkly. I read a few others this week, not just half empty, pessimist, half full, you know, optimist. I, I read that a physicist sees the glass as half filled with water and half filled with air. Some of you are like that. I don't like you who are like that, but that's okay. An engineer sees that the glass is twice as big as it needs to be. (laughs) Why would you have a glass that big when you don't have much water? A cynic can't get past who drank the other half of this drink. And a mom just sees a mess that she's going to have to clean up. If you don't put a lid on that glass for one more time, that's kind of how we are. The old glass full, empty debate, it's meant to be a test of perception. How we view the world, others, ourselves, and our situations. It, it doesn't deal with facts or reality. How you perceive the glass to be filled, be it empty or full, it does not change the truth. It only is a test of perception. Only how a person views reality. For the first time in a really long time, The children of Israel have seen themselves for who they really are, and it's not a pretty picture. They are definitely not half full kind of people. About three weeks prior to this passage in Nehemiah chapter 9, they had all joined together at the town square where they listened to Ezra the high priest read from the Torah for over five hours. Five hours hearing those first five books of Scripture read. They stood and they listened, and as they did, they knew that they had sinned against God. There was no need for a preacher. There was no need for anybody to point out their failures. Merely reading the Word of God proved to them, I have fallen short of His standard. So they mourned and they wept until Nehemiah, the governor of Jerusalem, he commanded them to go home and to celebrate. God's people were finally understanding that they had broken God's heart and they were sorry for it. So in Nehemiah's mind, and rightfully so, he said, this isn't a day of mourning, this is a day of celebration. You're finally ready to obey God, so go home and celebrate. Well, the next day after the day of celebration and feasting, the heads of the houses joined in the town square again to hear Ezra read scripture. And so they would go back home after hearing it and they would teach their families. Well, as Ezra read to the heads of the household and the Levites that morning, they found out that Levitical law said that they were supposed to be celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacles. It was a religious observance where everyone moves out of their home For a week, and they live in tabernacles or booths or tents, really kind of lean-tos. And they were, during that week, supposed to remember what it was like for their forefathers who wandered in the wilderness trying to get to the promised land. Now, even though the children of Israel could have come up with about a thousand different excuses as to why they would not or should not observe the tabernacle feast, they did it anyway. In some minds, it probably seemed irresponsible to build these shanty lean-tos when their own houses were not even built yet. All of the energy that they put in propping up a tent could have been put into building a roof, a sturdy roof for your children. But nevertheless, they obeyed and they celebrated. And as a result of their obedience, God brought them, in verse 8 it says at the very end of the chapter, very great gladness. Last week we talked about Joy only comes through obedience. Oftentimes, we are not obeying God, therefore we do not experience joy, and were we to just fall in line with God's word and what God has said, we would begin to experience the blessings of his relationship or a relationship with him. But now, the feast is done. Chapter 9, the feast is over. 
the celebrating, it's finished. And they are once again faced with how sinful they are, how sinful they were to have forsaken God for all those years. And so they wander back into the town square, the city square, and they're desperate to hear from God again. And in verse 1, it adds another level to it. They don't just come haphazardly to the city square. They come prepared. Verse 1, now on the 24th day of this month, about two days after the Feast of the Tabernacle was over, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. That was a common response to grieving in that era of history. It was to fast. It was to go without food for an extended period of time, not just from breakfast to lunch, but to skip meals and to really feel the weight of loss. Another thing that they would do is they would wear sackcloth. Sackcloth, at least our understanding of it, was an uncomfortable robe that was made of goat's hair, not on the outside, but the inside. So you were itchy the entire time you wore it. It wasn't appealing to look at nor to wear. And the last thing they would do is they would heap dirt or they would heap ashes on their heads. And it was basically a sign of, I'm as good as dead. You might as well bury me now. I am so distraught. I am so hurting now. I am of no good to anybody. So they were uncomfortable. They were thinking that there was no good of their life. And they were going without food. And that's how they show up to the city square this third time when they come to Ezra and ask him to read the word of the Lord to them. In verse 2 it says, Then those of the Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. The time spent around God's word and the people of God worshiping God had made them acutely aware of their sin against God. God. I read recently uh, an author by the name of Stephen Davey. He says that we are not broken by our sin because we have learned to manage our sin. We have learned to manage our sin. We know how to clear our history. We know when not to say that thing around that person. We learn to manage our sin rather than to be broken over our sin. The children of God, they are broken over their sin. I'm careful to say it this way. They've experienced moments of intense revival where they have spent days out in tents where they've been celebrating and worshiping God. But this really is chapter 9. This is kind of the morning after syndrome of revival. They have reached the pinnacle in verse 8. There is very great gladness, but then you got to wake up the next morning in verse 9. That spiritual high is over. They are no longer around friends whose sole desire is to do God's will. When I was the student pastor here at New Hope, I really saw it with kids who had come back from E-Team or Truth and Peace or they'd come back from camp and, man, camp was great. That mission trip was amazing. And then you got back home and you fell into the exact same situation that you were in before. That's chapter 9. They had all lived in tents and they remembered the hardships of their fathers. They remembered that they are the ones that God had chosen to occupy this land. And then Monday morning essentially hits and it hits hard. Celebrating is over. The feast is finished. Church is dismissed. They wake up the next morning with a lot of the same impulses to sin as before the revival started. They realized that, oh, my sin has come back. And I have that same tendency to fall away from God. And so the morning after revival hit them hard. But this is true revival. It's not scripted. It's not scheduled. No one is making them meet in the city square. No law is forcing them to be there. Even while in their sin, they experience a bit of revival in verse 3. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God. For one fourth of the day and for another fourth, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. A Jewish day is 12 hours long, uh, kind of measured from sunrise to sunset. 
So the way that we ought to read this is that they read scripture together for three hours and then they confessed their sins and worshiped God for three hours. Don't complain about how long I preach, by the way. Six hours. Three, hearing the word of God read. And then three, confessing and worshiping God. I want you to see what this worship service looked like. You'll see more similarities in our service, and you'll also see some differences in our service to what we've done this morning already. Verse 4, there's a list of names here. It says that they all cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God in verse 4, and then in, in verse 5, and the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Hadijah, Shabaniah, and Pethiah said, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Jeff played the role of these Levites this morning when he welcomed you and he said, stand up. And we sang those songs, very similar songs to what they sang, by the way. Ones that celebrate who God is and what he has done for us. By the way, that ought to be the only song that a child of God sings. Who God is and what he has done for us. So here's the format of this worship service this Monday morning after revival. These men, these 11 individuals listed, but there's possibly more, they stand on the steps that are going up to the platform. So if you could see it as Ezra reading from the pulpit that they had built, there are steps leading up to it. And the way it's written, we believe that this is rather high. So it's rather steep. And there are all the way down at Levites and these leaders of Israel standing in front of them. And they stand on those steps to the platform and in unison, they call for all of the congregation to stand. And they then lead Israel in a corporate prayer. It's the longest recorded prayer in all of the Bible. And when I say corporate prayer, you probably have the vision of thousands of people standing there, heads bowed, eyes closed, hands folded like this. And that's not necessarily what is going on here. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what I mean by this corporate prayer here. This prayer is written in Hebrew poetic verse. It's written in 12 stanzas, the whole chapter is. And since they didn't have screens or hymnals or even individual copies of Scripture back then, a line was probably sung by the Levites and then it was repeated by the congregation. And when I say sung... Do not think that they used modern harmonies. If you've ever heard a Jewish prayer or maybe even a Muslim call to prayer, you kind of get the picture. It's more of a sing-song chant rather than four-part harmony on a chromatic scale. Just to put us in the mindset, I want us to, to practice this morning. So everybody go ahead and stand, okay? Joe's not going to put this on the screen. I'm not going to do it in the chant but I want you to repeat a phrase after me, all right? Don't look at your Bibles, no cheating. I want you to be there, just like it was in Nehemiah chapter 9. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your glorious name. Wow, that was really good. Which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Lord. You have made a heaven. The heaven of heavens with all their host. The earth and everything on it. The seas and all that is in them. And you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Have a seat. Nothing will make you more acutely aware of making sure that you read correctly when a whole group of people is repeating after you. And that's what it was. Twelve stanzas long, with possibly other hymns, other psalms, sung even in between these, but this is the one that has lasted in Scripture what God had for us. Earlier in verse 3, Nehemiah said that the children of Israel confessed and worshipped the Lord for one-fourth of the day. Now, when we hear confess, we automatically think, or we automatically fill in the next phrase, of their sin. They confessed their sin. And that is true. They do that. 
I believe it's verse 1 where it says they confess their sin. But confession is not always related to sin. You just confessed this morning. To confess, or amalageo, it literally means to say the same thing as, or to agree. When we confess our sin, we say the same thing about our sin as God does. That's what confession is. We first agree with God that what we have done is sin. That it is sinful behavior. Do you know who gets to define sin? Not you. Not your culture. Not your mom, not your dad. Who defines sin? The one who is righteous. God alone defines sin. So when we confess our sin, we are first off agreeing with God that what we have done is sinful. But then secondly, when we confess our sin, we also agree with the consequences of our sin. The children of Israel absolutely do that in chapter 9, but they also confess their faith to God. And that's what I want us to focus in on this morning. We are going to praise God. We are going to confess his greatness this morning. And I want us to start by dissecting verse 6 and see what they really just confessed, what we really just confessed about God. Verse 6, you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and everything on it with the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. The first thing about who God is, we learn that he is creator, sustainer, and redeemer. That's what verse 6 says. Who is God? He is, we confess, creator of this universe, sustainer of our lives, and redeemer of our souls. What we might glance over and take for granted today in church is a foundational and a transformational truth about God. We just read over verse 6, or we just spouted it off as you heard me say it, and perhaps we didn't really feel the weight of it. When the children of Israel said, He alone is Lord. The Jews are coming out of years and years of Babylonian and Persian exile where they were expected to live by the laws and traditions of not just the political system of the Babylonians and Persians, but also the religious one, too. They changed their names, Daniel, Belshazzar. They changed everything who they were. The thought thought that there was only one God would have been absurd to the Babylonians. And the thought that there was one God who is all-powerful to form and sustain his creation would have been a laughable idea by the Persian. What they have just confessed about God, that he alone is Lord and he alone made heaven and sky and sea and earth, it is foundational to the Christian faith and it is by far different from the culture which they lived in and honestly the one in which we live today. All throughout Hebrew praises to God, you'll find a a predominant theme The Israelites will celebrate God as creator, sustainer, redeemer. So let's talk about creator. Here Israel is setting God apart from all other gods that they've ever been introduced to. This God, Jehovah, is the only God. He created all that we see and even that which we cannot see. You can see that when Nehemiah writes, heaven and the heavens of heavens, earth, everything on it, seas and everything in it, It's as if he were saying that, Lord, you created both the physical, that which I can see with my eyes, and the spiritual, that which I will never be able to see. He is the origin of it all. But he's also the sustainer. The latter part of verse 6 says, and you preserve them all. It's a confession that God is intricately involved in his creation. He's not, as some deists might believe, a grand watchmaker who created the world and its systems and he created science and physics and now he is letting it run into disrepair. That's not who this God is at all. There's a tendency for us to sometimes think that. 
When we see natural disasters like floods and fires and earthquakes and eruptions and superstorms, all of which we have experienced this week, perhaps not in our geographical location, but all throughout the world, this week those things have happened. We know, because he is the sustainer, that God is not aloof. He's not indisposed at the moment. That that storm didn't just slip by his radar. He is in control, and though we don't see or understand all of his purposes, it is only by his good grace that the flood doesn't reach a little farther, that the fire doesn't burn a little more, and the earthquake is not a little stronger. He sustains his creation. He is intricately involved in his creation. But that is even more seen Not in how he deals with the physical universe, but how he deals with our own souls. He's not just the God of the cosmos. He is the redeemer of mankind. Who is God? Let's look at what he does. He loves. He forgives. The only way God could redeem mankind was to offer himself as a perfect human sacrifice. So he needed to step into humanity as if a author might write himself into the story that he is pinning. God picks a family, one of whom is willing to serve his purposes, and he picks a father of that family, one who is a willing servant. Verse 7, you are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and gave him the name of Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. While the Israelites only saw God's covenant as a means to obtain land and an identity as a nation, God was doing so much more through Israel behind the scenes. He is creating a people who were peculiar from the world because through them he would send his son who would be very different from any other who had ever walked the earth. So God chose a family that his son might grow up into. This family, the Jews, Abraham's family would host the perfect son of God. But they were far from perfect. They are like us. They have Adam and Eve's rebellious blood coursing through their veins. Time after time, God would deliver them. And yet, they would ignore. I want to take you through the rest of this chapter And read portions of it for you. So pick up reading with me in verse 15. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. And brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. And told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. Time after time God had delivered them. Given them food when they were hungry. Given them water when they were thirsty. Given them lamb when they were homeless. But time after time. They rebel. Time after time, I rebel. Verse 16. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. We'll hold on there for a second. In all actuality, the Levites were leading the congregation of Israel through a summarization of the whole Old Testament. In fact, it's Genesis right up until that very last book or one of the very last books written in the Old Testament, which is, in fact, Nehemiah. It might not be so in the order of your 66 book canonical right there, but chronologically it is so. They walked them through Moses and God delivering the children of Israel from Egypt. They walked them through Joshua and God leading them into the promised land. They walked them through the judges 
and God allowing them to be captives until their hearts would return to him. They take them through the times of the kings, David, Solomon, and the rest, and God's blessing them for their obedience. After every era of Israel's history, they hardened their hearts. They stiffened their necks. They shrugged their shoulders. They acted proudly. They refused to obey. They rebelled. They cast God's law behind their backs. And they even killed God's prophets. All phrases taken from Nehemiah chapter 9. After every era of Israel's history, they did one of those. What I want you to understand this morning is that Israel's story is Corey's story. That Israel's story is your story. We are teenagers to our loving father. We harden our hearts, we stiffen our necks, we shrug our shoulders, we act proudly, refuse to obey, and we rebel. I want you to think of this week the thousands, perhaps even millions of times you have sinned just this week weak. The sinful thoughts, the sinful actions, the sinful desires that you have had this week, every bit of them was a shrugging of the shoulder, a stiffening of the neck, an act of pride. It was a refusing to obey and a rebellious will against your creator, your sustainer, and the one who longs to redeem you. But he loves And I want us to see thirdly, when talking about who God is, I want you to see how he loves. He loves quickly and graciously and mercifully and abundantly. Read verse 17 with me. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful slow to anger, abundant in kindness. You did not forsake them. Nevertheless, verse 31, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them. For you are God, gracious and merciful. I know I'm having you do quite a bit of flipping around, but turn back to verse 17. And for just a few minutes, I want you to see the dichotomy here. What they have just confessed about God is that he is quick to love, gracious to love, merciful to love, and abundant in his love. When I say that he is quick to love, verse 17 says, but you are God, that second half there, but you are God, ready to pardon. Skip a line and go down to slow to anger. It's not that God has overlooked your sin. God has dealt with your sin on the cross. And what we have now is a God who has a very long fuse. He is long-suffering. He is patient even in our rebellion. The idea of slow to anger and ready to pardon. It's as though right now, this second, he is willing and ready to forgive. He is gracious and he is merciful and he is abundant in his kindness and his love. God's desire for you is not one of judgment, but of forgiveness. Hear me. Hear me. He is not some standoffish tyrant who just wants to send everyone who breaks his rules to hell. He is a forgiving Savior who doesn't just say, I love you, but he stretched out his arms to show you he loved you. And he took upon him all of your sin and all of mine so that any second you are willing and wanting forgiveness, it is yours. He is long 
suffering, slow to anger, but he is quick to love. He is quick to forgive. But I want you to see something. He leaves that choice directly up to you. No one else can make it for you, and he will not coerce you into following him. If you do not want him, he will not force himself upon you. Hear me. He is a romantic savior who woos you and brings you close to his side. He will not forcibly take you and make you his. He has left this forgiveness on the table and all you have to do is confess it. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want us to end. I know I've had you stand up, sit down quite a bit. But I want you to stand with me and we'll read verses 36 through 38. They've confessed the history of Israel, their own sin, their own rebellion. And here they are in verse 36. And this is their petition. This is their prayer to God. Here we are, servants today. And the land that you gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its bounty, we, here we are, servants in it. And it yields much increase to the kings you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure. And we are in great distress. And because of all this, because of all the distress, because of seeing all of their sin pass before them, all of their father's sin, hear what they now say. We make a sure covenant. Brother James talked about that sure covenant when he said at the age of 14, he gave his life over to God. We make a sure covenant and we write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. In closing chapter 9 of Nehemiah, I want you to know that you can make that covenant, that contract with God. You can give your life over to him and he will take it and he will make something wonderful out of it. There is no paper, no pen needed. There is no notary required. A covenant is a contractual promise. You can among people who love you today, make that promise to God. I am rebellious. You are quick to forgive. I give you my life. Look what he gives in return. Will you pray with me?